song. Amen. And I am so glad to be here in God's house today. Amen. I do not take it for granted that I'm allowed to be here. Amen. Every day that we wake up on this side of the grave is just more evidence that God is not finished with us yet. That there's still something he wants us to do. Sometimes I'm tempted to ask God, why me? But I also know that his grace is amazing. God doesn't need a reason to choose us. He loves us. And that's why he, he makes us his choice. And we make the Lord our choice because we love him. Amen. Acts chapter 17. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars hills and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found out an altar, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Verse 26, and hath made of one blood, one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord verse 27 if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us then verse 28 for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Thank you, ushers, for your reverence to God's word. Praise the Lord. God is good today. Amen. Let's pray for the word. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness toward us. And we pray that in this hour, as we have worshiped and prayed and praised, that as your word comes forth, God, that our hearts might reverence it, receive it. And that where deliverance is needed, it appears. Where healing is needed, it appears. Where direction is needed, it appears. God, perfect us by your word. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and by that authority, we do petition you. Amen. 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 Time has, um, time has changed a lot of things. But there's some things that never change. Some things that never change. Human behavior is what it is. It shows up in different places at different times in different ways, but it is what it is. If you know Christ, and I, when I say no, I don't mean just intellectually, but if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you know him that way, then it shows up in your behavior. Gotta love church in the city. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, then that also shows up in your behavior. And it, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a criminal or do what we consider evil things. 
But not having a relationship with the Lord matters as much as having a relationship with the Lord. And the world that we live in is a direct product of humanity as a whole not having a relationship with Jesus. While some of us do, most of us don't. That's not my personal judgment or observation or assessment. The Bible tells us that the way to everlasting life is narrow, and it says, few there be that find it. It is the judgment of the world, of the word, excuse me, that only a few will right, walk the righteous path. And it's not because God has determined that I'm only going to save 10% of humanity or some foolishness like that. It's that God puts out a call for us to move his way. And we choose not to. It's humanity's choice. And it's the choice we've been making since day one, friends. We didn't just start ignoring and disobeying God. It started with the first generation of humanity. It started with the man that we call Adam. And even though I'm a student of the word and I'm a pastor, which comes with some assumed special superpowers, um, there are things that I don't understand. There are things I don't get. There are questions I have for which I have no answers. They are lingering questions, questions I've had for a long time. I petition God for an answer and nothing comes. And it's always my assessment that if God's not answering one of my questions, then it's not a question that I need to really be asking right now. It's not pertinent to my life in any way. There's nothing I can do about things. And it's just idle curiosity on my part. One of the questions, though, that nags at me is this question of racial identity because it factors into so much that we're experiencing now. You know, I look over at our congregation, and it's been my prayer for a long time that we be a multicultural congregation. I didn't want to be a black church. I just wanted to be a church. Right? right? Just church. Who, whoever was seeking the Lord and could find him here, Lord, send them here. You know, rich, middle income, poor, educated, undereducated, uneducated, right? Refined, ghetto. I didn't care. Send them here. I've always wanted our church to be a place for everybody. I didn't want to be a church that had a particular character of person. Everybody. Fresh out of the university, come here. Fresh out of prison, come here. Member of a fraternity, come here. Member of a gang, come here. Because the Bible tells me that God's not willing that any should perish. And so I'm not willing that any should perish. Whosoever will, God tells us, let them come. So I feel like the church, the mission of the church is whosoever will, let them come. But we are human. And when I say we, I mean all of us under the sound of my voice, anybody who's watching me on YouTube or who will hear me otherwise. This message goes out to the ages. We are human, and if we are not careful, the fallibility, the frailness, the fragility, the errancy of our humanity will permeate everything we do. And not, no matter how much we call ourselves Christians, we will often act unchrist like because we are not monitoring the weaknesses that we have. We're not acknowledging them. We ignore them. And they pop up at the worst possible time in the worst possible way. Somebody sitting there going, Pastor, what are you talking about this morning? Well, it, it strikes me that we are now in the last Sunday, I believe, uh, of Black History Month. Am I right about that? All right. 
Um, and I have struggled with black identity and what that means. Now, some of you are like me. When I was growing up, um, particularly after I came to California, so that would have been, I was, a, I was in kindergarten when I came to California. Um, so five, six, year old, six years old. Um, and I came from the South, so I had, a little, I had a little accent from the South. But because I was five or six, I was still in that formative stage, so I was able to shake it real fast. And I started to speak like I was from California. You know, when I first came here, I used to call soda cold drinks. Right. Who got some cold drinks? Because that's what we called it down south. And very soon I started calling it pop, like everybody else out here was calling it. And I adopted the language and the tendencies of my new home. And then we went back to New Orleans, and I carried that with me. And I was older, and I never shook it. So I, I talked like this among my southern friends. And man, how many times was I told, you talk like you white? whatever that means. And I got all the heckling that you get when you wear that identity. You're an Oreo, you're trying to be whatever. You're, you know, you're sold out. And I've worn that all my life. It, I never shook that. And it was amazing when I worked with professional adults of other cultures who would say the same thing. In so many words, they would say, you're different. And I always thought, different than whom? I loved when they said, you are so articulate. These other white guys I work with who talk just like me, do you tell them that they are articulate? Why are you so surprised that I can speak the king's English? I went to the king's schools. I studied the king's books. I live in the king's world. It makes sense that I speak the king's English. But clear, it was clear to me from when I was a teenager that the expectation on me as a young black man was just a little lower than my peers. Just a little less was expected of me. And it, and it wasn't easy for me to impress, and I've actually benefited from that all my life. It wasn't easy for me to impress, so when I did something to impress, folks were like, oh, we're going to give you a promotion. Okay, I'll take it. Right? Just because you have low expectations of me and I perform at a level that you didn't expect and you think somehow I'm special, go ahead, I'll take it. It's a raise, I got a family, pay my bills. But I struggle with the idea that people look at people and go, you're less than on the basis of color and culture. And it's not just something I struggle with as a black man in the world that pressed against me and thought less of me. I existed in communities where those communities did the same thing towards other people. And that floored me. How can oppressed people look down on anybody? Y'all just give me a few minutes and I'll be done today. I'll be out of your hair, okay? How can you be put upon, judged, marginalized, and then turn around and do that to another group of people? Are you kidding me right now? Are you kidding me right now? And yet, you all know in your heart of hearts it's done. You know, we as groups, we subdivide on anything. It really doesn't matter, but color is the big thing. You're black, you're white, you're brown, you're red, you're yellow. Really? So I want to share something with you this morning. Just give me a minute. In the book of Genesis, when God creates man, he creates us out of the earth. And the name of the first man, we know it to be Adam. Now, his name is Ha'adama, or Adama. That name isn't like the names that we give each other. Denise, Richard, Max. It comes from a culture where names meant something. They, they said something about either the attribute of a person or the desired attribute from that person. So it, it, it spoke to your character, your, the, your, your content as a person. And so when, when uh, Adam is recognized in scripture, 
He's recognized by the only thing he could be recognized by at, at that time, his color. Adam means red. It means red. And contextually, it means red clay. Makes sense. He's made out of the fresh, fertile red clay of the earth. He's a red man. He's a red man. Then God does something wonderful. He, he takes from the side of Adam a rib and fashions it into a woman. The red man has a white rib removed, and that white rib is made into a woman. I wonder what color that woman was. I don't know. Was she red? Was she white? Was that the first mixed race couple in the earth? Did they have biracial babies? I look around today and we've got lots of mixed race couples in here. It's a beautiful thing. I hope to impanel you all one day and you can tell us about your experiences because I know that they're unique. But we act like the things that we experience today are fairly new when they're not. They're as ancient as our existence on the planet. We've always had these struggles, and that's the question that's been nagging at me, like, Lord, why? Why do we have these struggles? Of all the things that we can struggle with, why is it the pigmentation in our skin? Why is the color of our skin even a thing? They call us black and white. Now, a couple of us in here are probably close to the black. We, like, deserve black because we are, like, blue-black. But for the most part, if I lined up all the black people in here, you have everything from uh, Starbucks Misto coffee. Y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Like super light, like milk light. All the way to double shot espresso. That's who we are. The creationist will tell you that's who we always were. When God created humanity, they would, they would suggest that, that genetically he created us to produce many different colors. Others will say, they will point to Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10 and then Genesis 11, where, where in Genesis chapter 10, a man named Nimrod becomes the first man who is recognized as a mighty man, a leader. In fact, he was a great hunter, Genesis 10. Genesis 11, the people come together under him, and we're going to make this great tower. We're going to build it up to God. And God looks at us, and he says, look, all you multiracial people hanging out in the same place, thinking the same way, but you're all thinking wrong. You're all wrong. That's so meaningful to me. That is so meaningful to me. All you different people coming together, because I think one of the things we think is, you know what, if we as humans can get together, Christians, let me tell you something. It ain't always a good thing when people get together, because we don't always do the right thing. We've seen that in history where people, the, the Germans came together. How did that turn out? So the answer for the world's ill is not just that we come together. So whenever I hear Christians say that, I go, man, I wish they would just read the Bible, because in Genesis 11, the people came together. And it was disastrous. We're going to show God. We're going to build a tower up to him to show him we're just like him again. Same thing happened in the garden. That's why we got kicked out in the first place. Trying to compete with God. And here we go again. Trying to compete with God. Show him how smart we are. Show him how creative we are. The Bible says God saw that. And he said, if we don't stop these people right now, they're going to wreck this place. And so the scripture says in the King James Version, he confounded their language that's why we have different languages. And then it said after that, that he scattered them all over the earth. Because it turned out that hanging in one place and thinking the same way was not the answer. We'll talk about the answer in a minute. Okay. So God does all, all of this happens. This is Genesis. We haven't even gotten out of the book of Genesis yet. There's, there's 65 more books to go, and we already tearing the place up. <laughs> Later on in Genesis, we, we are introduced to this man by the name of Abraham. Abraham comes from a place called Ur, you are. You know what's in Ur right now? 
Iraq. Iraq. Now, you know, for those of you who remember studying this in school, there have been all kinds of migration patterns through all these places throughout the years. But today we would say that Abraham was Iraqi. Think about the way we feel about Iraqis today. Do we have fond thoughts of Iraqis today? No, we think blowing up airplanes and killing people. But the reason why we think that is because we've been fed a, a, a constant diet of how to view people, not their governments, people. See, it's not, it's not when the leader of Iraq gets on the plane that we get nervous. It's anybody who in any way looks like they're from the Middle East where we go, hmm, are they a terrorist? Just the way white people look at your black face coming down the street and think, hmm, are they going to mug me? There, there is this very clear plan by the enemy to divide us on whatever he can, and typically it's the visual stuff, how we look, our color. And, and without even realizing it, we buy into that foolishness. How many, don't, do not answer this, don't embarrass yourself, this is rhetorical. How many of you black people have looked at a black establishment and go, I ain't going in there because you know black people don't know how to do nothing? Hmm. It's not just that we have issues with other folks. Because we buy into the lie, we have issues with ourselves. How many times have I heard black people go, you know, black people, look at all them books. Black people don't read like that. Which black people don't read like that? I know plenty of black people who read. We're not allergic to intelligence. We're not enemies of education. But if you believe the trope that's out there, most black men are in prison. No, they're not. There are more black men in college than there are in prison, but the lie is there are more in prison than there are in college. Color. This is all, this is all, do you understand how foolish this is? This is all based on color. How much melanin you got in your skin? What correlation is there between the shade of your skin and the way your brain operates? Where's the science to even support that? There is none. Let me just cut to the chase. There is none. This is all manufactured foolishness. And it creeps into the church because even in the church, we go, yeah, we a black church and we, we celebrate blackness in God's house. Sorry, I ain't with it. I ain't with it because I will not add to the lie. I will not. I'll get to that in a moment. Do we need to know our history? You better believe we need to know our history because it was pulled from us. There was a crime perpetrated against a whole group of people. Yeah, other people have been oppressed. The Japanese were oppressed. They got reparations. The Native Americans were oppressed. They got reservations. We were oppressed. We got, yeah, I ain't got nothing else for you. We got nothing. Some would suggest we got welfare. I didn't get my share. I didn't get my share. So, yeah, I'm not in any way suggesting that 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 the plight of black people is a non issue and it should be ignored. I think we should we should give pause and, and say to ourselves, who are we as a people? But what I'm suggesting to you this morning, and I'm going to go back to Acts 17, 26 to support this, is that we have always done better when we've acknowledged God first as a people. It's not what happened in the mosque that set the civil rights movement on fire. It's what happened in the church. And every meeting was started with a prayer and a sermon. And that galvanized people. It marshaled, it mobilized people. It gave them energy and inspiration. And best of all, it gave them purpose because we were able to say in God's eyes, we are all one. In God's eyes, we had the highest possible standard to reach up to. And that mattered. Who can argue with that? We're all God's children. Amen, somebody. Abraham, Iraqi. You know what? It's amazing how, how life works. 
when we, when we talk about Egypt and all the wonderful things, you know, I, my wife and I, we talk about all the time, we, we want one of our next trips to be to Egypt. You know, I want to I want to see the archaeology. The, the, I want to see the, the, the pyramids. We've, we've gone to different places, and we've been able to see uh, mummified remains. And I just love to go to the place where they come from and, and soak that up. But when we say Egypt, we don't even realize we're talking about Africa. There is such a pride in the history of, of Egypt. But that's the history of Africa. Because Egypt is Africa. But see how the enemy works? Give them different names, give them very discreet identities, one from another. Egypt, rich in history and culture and education. Africa, poor and broke down. <laughs> Egypt is as much as Africa as Uganda is and Nigeria. But it doesn't, it doesn't live that way in our minds because the enemy has quite successfully, quite successfully put us in these discreet subgroups, some being inferior to others. And without realizing it, again, we've bought into the lie. Hmm. In the book of Numbers, chapter 1, we get this wonderful account. And actually, I think it's Numbers, chapter 12. We get this wonderful account of Moses. Y'all know Moses, right? If you've been in church a day, you know who Moses is, right? So. All right. We all know Moses. Moses, catch this, watch this. Moses married a black woman. Numbers 12, she was Cushite, black. And I mean, like real black, not, you know, not misto black, espresso black. And it moved his brother and his sister, Miriam and Aaron. They did not like that. They did not like that. And they held Moses accountable, and then God held them accountable for their separatist thinking because God wasn't with it. God was like, this is my friend. Y'all better back up. You think God has a problem with a light-skinned Moses being with a dark-skinned woman? Now, some would argue, some would pull this out, and, and they, would use, they would use very sharp exegesis to suggest to you that Miriam and Aaron had a problem with the culture of the Cushites and not the color. No, because there were many in Israel who were mixing with other races at the time, but they called their brother out because while that was okay for their friend's household, it wasn't okay for their household. See, I don't mind black people on the job. I don't mind going to school with black people or having the shop with black people. But my white daughter or my Hispanic daughter, my Latina, better not bring one of them black things home. Now wait, because I'm going to be fair here. I'm going to be fair here. How many black folks have said, why can't you find a girl in your own race? Why can't you find a man in your own race? You know how those people are. Someone once told me, and I believe this, that the best disinfectant is light. Light. Because that which grows, that which is born in darkness can't grow in light. And that which is born in light can't grow in darkness. Y'all feel what I'm saying? When you shed light on, on, on the lie and the deception, we are able to see it for how ridiculous it truly is. We are talking about skin color. Nothing else. All this foolishness, all this back and forth is skin color. It's why the light-skinned Nicaraguan don't like the dark-skinned Nicaraguan. It's why the light-skinned Australian don't like the dark-skinned Aboriginal. Skin color. We both live in the same place, eat the same food, breathe the same air, go to the same schools. But we're different. Why? Because one of us is dark. And 
One of us is like, I'm going to tell on the black people, so y'all just stay with me. Do you, for you non-black people, right, do you not know that we're so foolish that the light-skinned blacks have aught with the dark-skinned blacks and vice versa? Man, I got stories from my family. I got stories. There, there are sections of my family that still don't talk today. It's the light-skinned ones who the dark-skinned ones say they're all uppity. They think they're better than us. No, you're, you're projecting. You're projecting. That foolishness comes from way back on the plantation when the light-skinned blacks were light because they were the master's children and they lived in the master's house and they got more of the master's provisions and so the field slaves didn't look highly upon the house slaves. Ain't none of us slaves no more, but we still think like field slaves and house slaves. Lord, help us today. God wasn't with that. Miriam, Aaron, calm down. Calm down. I got this. How many of us are Miriams and Aaron's in the house? Huh. Solomon. Solomon had lots of wives. I mean, do had lots of wives, right? But only one gets her own book in the Bible. <laughs> only one gets her own book in the Bible. And in the book of songs, the song of songs, or some says the songs of Solomon, chapter one, verse five, she says, I am beautiful and I am dark. <laughs> I feel good just saying those words. I am beautiful and I am dark. Feel free to say that about yourself, by the way, because as I look around, everybody in this room is beautiful and everybody in this room is some shade of dark. Amen. 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 Right. Everybody, some shade of dark. Yes. We should all take that DNA test. I bet you we all got a little African in us. Right. Hmm. She says, I am dark and I am beautiful. And then she goes on and say, don't hate me because I'm dark. You think this stuff just started happening? <laughs> it's been happening a long time, man. In the New Testament, as I wrap this up and get to verse 26, in the New Testament, Jesus is going to Calvary, right? And he's, they made him carry his own cross. And he's carrying his, his own cross. And remember, he's been bleeding all night. He's been bleeding all night, so he's weak. I'm pretty sure they didn't feed him and give him water, so he's weak. And on his way to, on, on his way to Golgotha, the mount where he would be crucified, the Bible says he stumbles and he falls and he drops the cross. And, they, and, and the guards tell this man who's standing nearby to help him carry his cross. And who was that man? It was Simon of Cyrene. It was an African man. An African man helped Jesus carry the cross to Calvary. Now, I'm not being a hypocrite. I'm not saying that makes black people superior because we helped Jesus. Like, like we together all got together and said, let's go down there and help Jesus carry the cross. It didn't, we didn't have a meeting first. It didn't work that way. But my point is, is that I do, I do discern that there is some self-loathing among us, too. The issue with color isn't just one group against another group. It's how we self-identify. Some of our children will never go beyond a cer certain point because they are very aware that their blackness is viewed, is viewed in, as inferior to others. Which is why we dress and talk and do the things we do, because we want to show, hey, we're one of you, so we'll assimilate. We'll look like you and talk like you and act like you, just so that you know that, that we're one of you. Will you accept us, please? Yes, this is not the authentic me, and this is not really what I want to do or how I really want to be, but, but I'm going to be like this and do these things because I want the greater culture to accept me. Paul says, be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewal. Walk authentically in Christ. You are valuable because God created you that way. Regardless of the texture of your hair, the color of your skin, or the way you pronounce your words. God made you valuable. That's why you're valuable. Y'all almost done with me. I'm, I'm almost finished. Philip is on going back home from a feast 
And he meets this Ethiopian on the road who's reading the book of Isaiah. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? God has ordained him to go over to this man and begin to minister to him. And he goes over to the man and he begins to minister to this, this high official in Ethiopia, this eunuch. And the man believes the gospel and he receives Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he's, he's baptized the same day, this Ethiopian man. This is the first generation church. We have always been around. And when I say we, I mean people of color have always been here. We didn't just show up during slavery, which is another odd I have against Black History Month. All we talked about is slavery and how we came out of slavery. I didn't start being black. My people didn't start being black when they brought us to America. I was, we were black way before that. We've been black since the beginning. And there's lots to our history. Too much to tell. And why they give us the shortest month anyway? Don't get me started. Ethiopia received the gospel and was baptized. And then finally this, Acts chapter 13 talks to us about a man named Lucius, who was also a Cyrene African, and Simeon the Niger. I wonder what color he was. You know what they were? They were prophets and teachers in the first generation of churches. And they were men who commissioned other men to go out and spread the gospel during that generation. And you know who was ordained and commissioned by those two black men? Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul had black hands laid on him to bring him into the ministry. Here's the point I'm making, and I'm going to make it succinctly, and I'm going to let you go. I'm making this point. Acts chapter 17. Verse 26. It talks to us about God and he hath made of one blood, one blood, all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Later on, we learn that it's in God that we live. It's in God that we live. That we move. And that we possess our being. Everybody has to make a choice. Everybody has to make a choice. What's going to be the first thing I identify with in my life? What is going to be the overarching theme and principle of my life? Am I going to be a woman or a man? A feminist? I ain't got nothing. I ain't got no problem with women getting everything they have coming to them. But let me tell you something, you're all making a choice. All of us are making the choice when we make that thing the first thing. Because whatever you make the first thing, everything else has to serve it. Right. Amen. Be careful. So if you make your blackness the first thing, right? If you make your ethnicity, your, your racial background, if you make your nationality, I love the nationalist. I'm an American. America is the best country that there ever was. What, how many other countries you live in? Please tell me, how many other countries have you lived in? Don't tell me that you took a cruise somewhere and all of a sudden, you know, just because you got off the boat for two hours don't mean you know a country. What other countries have you lived in? How do you know America is the best country? Shh, pastor, they go, no, you, you putting this on the Internet. They go, no, you're not a patriot. Come for me. Come for me. But here we are, 4th of July, waving our little flags. <laughs> help me, somebody. Somebody help me. I got questions. Somebody help me. I don't understand. Why, why is it that we don't realize that we have been called by God to serve him? When he becomes our first identity, it is so easy to put everything else in order. It is not that I disregard my blackness. I love my blackness. And I know that there are some inherent strengths I have because of what my people have been through. But having said that, I subordinate everything in my life to my service to Christ. Because when I do that, if it's wrong, I can call it wrong and I don't care who it was wrong by. <laughs> When I subordinate everything to my faith, I see things as they are, not as I want them to be. When I subordinate everything to my faith, I understand the nature and the origin of my true strength as a human. And it overcomes the politics of my time. 
I got as many problems with Obama as I got with Trump. Because at the end of the day, it's about who's doing God's will. Right. And I'm not a lie to any of the pharaohs. I speak for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm, I'm glad, Obama, that you evolved on homosexuals. Good for you. I have not so evolved. I'm glad you evolved on abortion. Good for you. I have not so evolved. And to my white brothers and sisters out there, I'm, I'm glad you're a patriot and you're a true American. Make America great again. There ain't one year in the past in this country's life that I'd like to go back to. Please name me one year that any of us want to go back to. What was it good for you? 19, 1987? Was that a good year for you? 1967? 2007? There ain't no year I want to go back to. Make America better. And in an age where everybody runs around talking about God bless America, he has. Will somebody in America bless God now? I will bless the Lord. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Yes, I'm a man. Yes, I'm a black man. But above all else, I'm God's black man. Let's stand. He made us all. And whatever shade you are, if I cut you, what comes out will be red. 1726, he made us all of one blood. Father, I thank you for your loving kindness to us. Lord, and I thank you for the truth that you reveal to us uniquely. There is no other source in our life where we get truth the way we get it from you. And my desire for all of us, God, is that we would hear you speaking to us in these terrible times where there is so much confusion in the world and folks literally don't know what truth is. Help us to know, Lord Jesus, that you are the truth. You are the truth, the way and the life. Help us to know you in Jesus' name. If you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the most important thing. Do that now. Come.